Um, now I'd like to open the floor to the audience, and I can see people are champing at the bit here to, uh, to ask questions. Can I ask that you keep your intervention relevant to the point and as brief as possible, and please identify yourself in any institutional affiliation you may have? Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Mansoor al -Ayab. I'm a freelance economist. Mansoor al Ajab, freelance economy. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a need that we need to admit that the nomads are the most marginalized people in the Sudan. One. Two, I think this type of talk can be extremely useful in resolving conflicts in the Sudan if it is brought to the attention of the government and to the attention of the rebels. It is extremely important to involve the stakeholders and in particular, I'm a nomad myself. Uh, what you call it, crossing boundaries, especially in federal government. You face dual taxation, which is a big problem. You, fa you, f you face harassment by the security organs like the police and so forth, because the nomads are very illiterate. The question of Qatar, if you are talking about, I come from Rufa'a Sharqidindir. We have a big problem with the Qatar over the Botana, because we don't have a historical grazing right there. And I think, you need to include us, please, then their D-I-N-D-I-R. You need to include us, because this is an area of potential conflict. The other <laughs> point, nomads, nomads, I'll be honest with you, they have not been to uh, Scotland to study forestry, but they are the ones who take good care of forestry as against mechanized farms. And this also has to be put into consideration. The marginalization of the nomads and the small scale producers did not come from nowhere. It came from the mechanized farming. There is a question Sorry, that- Sorry, I, I don't want to uh, interrupt you, but could you come to the, uh, okay. the question that, or the point? Okay, please. the question that I need uh, to raise now, please. You never mentioned any need for a land utilization plan. One. Two, you never mentioned the relation between the free market policies and the marketing imperfections within uh, this trade. I finally conclude by the, but the need to have soft borders between Sudan and South Sudan. Otherwise, ra people, rather than expanding, uh, what you call it, vertically, they are going to expand horizontally. And this explains now the feuds between some of the Arab tribes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and thank please you be much. as brief as you can. Thank you very much. My name is Khalid Al Mubarak. I am the media counselor at the Embassy of the Sudan in London. I would like to begin by saying that uh, attending this was a, like a breath of fresh air, uh, listening to people who have actually been to the Sudan, done research, they have worked with uh, Sudanese researchers, with Sudanese organizations, because we got used to uh, Hawajat uh, uh, handing over from above research to us, and uh, looking with the magnifying glass in order to find out how they can undermine our country or our uh, planet or whatever. So thank you very much to the three panelists and to the ODI and to Wendy for the introduction. My two, two points, the, the first is uh, about the abattoirs uh, in the recommendations. Uh, uh, during the last uh, years of the colonial administration, they actually, uh, they actually uh, established uh, abattoirs in my hometown in Costi. It was an Italian company, but apparently they, they made their uh, uh, feasibility study, there was some flaw in the feasibility study, so instead of uh, Darfur, they placed it in, co in, in, in Costi and it went out of business. But so uh, someone must have written a paper about this uh, somewhere. The other point is, uh, I have already mentioned it in my review of the paper, which is the, the uh, urbanization. I think this is very important, not only because of the, uh, the note, which was quite correctly made about the uh, different communities uh, having to uh, trade with each other and uh, help each other, but also because this will lead to detribalization. It will lead to the process which happened in the central Sudan, which happened with us. We don't fight, 
each other now because our ancestors left their uh, original uh, uh, lands and intermarried with the other people. They discovered that they have no tails and no horns and they intermarried with them. Mm -hmm. And now the, in the central Sudan, the tribes do not fight with each other. No, not because they are better than the people in Darfur, but because uh, the, the boundaries have uh, uh, disappeared between the different tribes because there is de -tribal. So urbanization in Darfur will lead to less conflict in, in the future and will lead to harmonized uh, living between the different constituents of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, let's take one more and then Mark, we'll Mark. refer to our panelists. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but, uh, I have very few points. Sorry, and, uh, could you just identify yourself? Uh, my name is Maui Shaddad. Uh, I'm from Sudan. I, I'm visiting UK these days. Uh, I work a lot with Sudanese societies. I'm also part of the steering committee that mentioned by Helen. Okay, uh, my question regarding Darfur, I think, uh, still I don't see the issue how you're going to build this market in Darfur. Uh, a few years ago when they were having uh, the uh, dam, Marawi Dam, they had four major lines. This is a very big dam. The issue of power to Darfur to develop and develop the livestock markets. Uh, they don't need to walk all these 1,000 kilometers to get to the markets in Khartoum or Khwai where they get fattened and so on. Okay, because the muscles already become tough meat to eat. Okay, this is one of the issues and I argued several years ago with Inta about why don't they make one of those lines goes to, actually one line was going north, one was going east in Tasupia, two lines were coming to Khartoum. I thought one of those very high power can go to Darfur, help in the development, and make possible to have airport and more modern slaughter houses, so they could actually, uh, in a, a certain high quality level, join that. And in a way, you may affect the issue we talked about before, so about the cultural aspect, whether you're going to change, because mobility obviously is related to a cultural way of life, rather than because you have cattle, you take them all the way hundreds of kilometers and they're only producing what two, three pounds, what do you call it, uh, of uh, milk, two, three liters of milk, or you put them in a, an enclosure and you feed them and then you have them fattened and you have them producing much more economics. Uh, and I didn't see any talk about the culture. How are you going to affect the culture? Once you talk about market, you talk about, so you're not, are you going to affect the culture? And it's very clear the sedimentary. Hardly anybody there. Their animals are not. The issue of the border, which I mentioned by my colleague. Sorry. The issue of the border, yeah. the yes. north south border. Can you uh, yes. wrap up? Okay. Thank you. The issue of the north south border. Uh, it, it never been addressed in the peace agreement. Mm -hmm. We talked as civil society. We pointed that if you have adoption of a separate Sudan developing independent country, you must address issue at an earlier times. Okay, and, and people were not talking about, they were only talking about political and so on, no, not talking about the social, the resources, the economic side of this border. Okay, the result, we are working, we are building a lot of wells around the areas of Babanusa, trying to soften the Sudanese Environment Conservation Society was concerned, trying to soften the impact and the movement you know, before they reach Bahr al Arab, and then you have a big conflict over there. Anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we could take one more, um, Suzanne. And um, can I just invite our online audience also to add their questions and comments? Um, Suzanne Jaspers, uh, Bristol University. Um, I guess my point kind of relates to somehow to what has been said um, before. Um, to kind of trying to get my head around different components of, of what we heard today. Um, I guess mostly kind of related to Darfur, and I'm trying to kind of get my head around the different, the different things that, different um, conclusions that Margie made about, um, you know, on the one hand, or, or, or putting the different elements together. She meant, uh, you mentioned Margie, <laughs> uh, uh, aspects of um, looting of livestock, um, higher uh, trading costs, uh, the concentration 
uh, ethnic concentration of traders. So I'm wondering, are you, I mean, in your recommendations, and I'm sure you're more kind of elaborate in the report, are you, are you recommending kind of supporting existing adaptations uh, as in, um, you know, supporting the camel market in, in, in Serif Umrah, supporting the meat industry in, in Niala. So, I mean, or, you know, are you talking bro more broader than that, I guess? And I think this also relates to, I mean, particularly the kind of meat industry and Niala and increasing urbanization. Um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking how that um, kind of uh, uh, links with pastoral mobility. Um, is it compatible? And I don't think um, that just relates to um, Darfur, but also Khartoum. I mean, in Khartoum, you have a rising uh, middle class, increasing demand for meat, for milk. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's a kind of broader question. I mean, how does that demand, increasing urban demand, link with um, pastoral mobility? Is it compatible? Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, we've got uh, a sort of mixture of comments and, uh, and questions here for the panel, and I'm not going to, to direct specific questions or comments to each of you, but I'm just going to start with Margie um, and ask you to respond to whichever ones you'd like to. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to try and weave two or three of the comments mm -hmm. together in my response. Um, so let me pick up where w with what Suzanne was saying, but I want to then relate to the other points that were made. Um, in terms of what we're recommending, I, I think what I really want to say is we're saying that the things that can be done right now in Darfur, uh, it's not a question of waiting until there's greater um, peace and stability. There's things that can be done immediately, um, and some of them would support existing adaptations. So where trading activity has shifted to more secure areas, and developing the, the physical market infrastructure in some of those markets are things that could be done right now, um, even whilst the situation is not fully resolved. Um, but of course, anything that's done in the current situation has to be done with a lot of sensitivity and with a lot of analysis of you know, who is benefiting and who may be losing out. Um, and so, for instance, in our recommendation that the, there should be a strategy for developing the meat industry in Darfur, it would be really important that that's an inclusive strategy so that small-scale livestock producers can benefit as well as the larger-scale livestock producers. So it's keeping that kind of in inclusivity in mind that I think is incredibly important. Um, and it sort of relates to um, some of, I think, some of the comments that were made about urbanisation because it's... L what happens now is going to have consequences for the longer term as well. And I think we can be pretty sure that the long-term future of Darfur means an economy that's able to cope with a, with a large urban population. Um, urbanisation is unlikely to be reversed. People will go back, but, th but there's going to be a much more urbanised population in Darfur than there has been in the past. And so how can the economy provide the kind of employment and the jobs for that more urbanised um, population? And, and actually, I'm going to make a link to the cash crop study that we're in the process of writing up at the moment, because... Um, in many ways, the Darfur economy has gone backwards during the conflict years, as the, um, the railway line um, is barely functional, as uh, power is such a huge problem, so particularly for agro-processing industries. But the a possible vision for Darfur in the future is um, an economy where there's much more value added to whatever Darfur is producing, whether it's livestock, whether it's meat, whether it's agro-processing of ground nuts, um, sesame, whatever it might be. It's how can you add value within Darfur, and that's a way of really making, providing jobs for a much more urbanised population. But that, in turn, requires a much more sophisticated and reliable um, infrastructure and electricity and power is an absolutely key one and and when we were doing the field work for the cash crop study agro processes again and again were saying we've had to abandon our large-scale 
ground nut milling plants and we're having to use very small scale ones where we can operate our own generators mm -hmm. because the power supply is so unreliable. So it's keeping that kind of longer term vision in mind. So anyway, I've tried to weave together some of the, the different points that were made. Thanks, Margie. Severia? Yes, uh, I will start from the end and uh, um, try to give an answer to, to this very pertinent question about the, the link between mobility, if I understand you well, and, and the rise in demand in meat. Now, if I understand you well, the, there is an implication in this question, and the implication is that the current uh, uh, system of production based on mobility is not supposed to be able to meet raising demand, so is implicitly low. Well, <laughs> but, uh, um, and to an extent, this is correct. Uh, the, the question is whether it is uh, uh, incapable of uh, uh, meeting raising demand because of mobility or because of other reasons. Um, my, my view would be that uh, mobility happens in certain areas uh, and by certain producers. And I, I'm totally convinced that it's the most fit way of producing in those conditions. Uh, but I'm also convinced that these areas have been uh, uh, the object of underinvestment for decades. Huh? Uh, so there, is no, there are no infrastructure. Uh, there are no safety nets for the producers. Um, there, are no, uh, there, is, there are no institutions designed fit to purpose to, to help them to, to, to make the best out of this best, best strategy. No? Um, in, in, in short, there is nothing of what there is in those other conditions that we look at as more productive, uh, or other states that we look at as more productive, Australia, New Zealand, uh, United States, and so on. So in absence of all this, uh, uh, um, probably not, m mobility as such will not manage. No? They still manage it quite well, despite of the absence of all this, but it will not. So the question, I would turn the question and would say, uh, um, uh, is the investment uh, uh, fit to, 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 to meet this high demand? Is, are the infrastructures fit to meet this high demand? Uh, is the institutional framework fit to meet this supposedly high demand? And so on. No? Uh, uh, so why do we look at mobility of all things, uh, in a way? Uh, and uh, 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 the culture, the culture, yes. Um, again, uh, 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 there is, a, there is a, a very strong need of a certain kind of culture to meet the requirements of this kind of production, which is very, very demanding uh, to, to the producer, uh, uh, both in terms of knowledge, in terms of endurance, in terms of uh, 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 competence, uh, uh, social organization, no? all things that depend on a certain kind of culture. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to... Uh, um, uh, keep uh, uh, traditions for the sake of it. That's a different story. That's why we put so much emphasis on modernization uh, and on the possibility of modernization without necessarily uh, uh, changing the, uh, uh, the core of the strategy, but modernizing it, yes. Yeah? Uh, um, we, we should be careful not to fall into the other culture, which is the culture of uh, uh, the only thing that works is if it's sedentary. No? Uh, which is very much ideological, ideological, just like like uh, like the other perspective. You know? Both sides, of course, have an ideological dimension. No? Uh, um, people have never moved as much as as now. No? Uh, in the United States, uh, you you rarely stay for more than three or four years in the same job, and you maybe change town uh, uh, thousand kilometers away. No? Uh, in Morocco, after the the settle the the nomads have been sedentarized, they are now moving more than them when they were nomads. They move as a, as a, as labor instead of moving like uh, livestock keepers. But they move more, no? and that movement is not considered mobility in, in the old sense because yeah? it looks like modern. So, no? there is a there is a uh, changes on changes in qualifying the 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 object we look at are uh, needed, no? uh, and, and that's very, very much the first step, I think. Requalification, renegotiation of a, of a qualifying perspective is, is the first step. That's my, my view, at least. Thank you, Severia. Helen, do you have any comments to make? Uh, yes, just two or three. Um, in relation to the point about um, pastoralism being a cultural way of life, 
Um, I thought it was very helpful how Severio pointed out that pastoralism is, pastoralism is both cultural identity and it's also a system of livestock production. And so when um, people say to me that it's a, a cultural way of life, I think obviously there are, obviously it is. But one of the examples I just wanted to, to, to raise to show how it's increasingly becoming a commercialised system of production is in relation to the production of sheep in South Darfur and also East Darfur. Um, normally sheep, uh, the, the, the sheep that are prized in Sudan are the desert sheep from the north and these are the ones that are exported and highly prized in, in the Middle East. And in response to that huge market demand for the past 10 or 15 years there has been a process of cross-breeding desert sheep with local sheep in South Darfur to produce a breed that still has the, 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 the taste qualities, you know, the meat is of the same quality as the desert sheep, but it has the hooves and the, the coat that can cope with the higher rainfall and the different soil conditions in South Darfur. And as a result, this new crossbreed commands a much higher price than the local breeds. And, you know, to quote colleagues, everybody I know is now moving into sheep, and sheep are the stepping stone if you, for, for pastoralists who've dropped out, want to get back into cattle herding, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of money to be made in sheep. So I think, you know, there isn't one situation regarding pastoralism that fits everywhere in Sudan. There is this diversity of experiences, and the commercialization is a, is a big issue. And um, the other pl point I just want to make is the point that was made about the land utilization plan. Whenever I hear about land utilization plans, I, I want to know what's, what's it going to be based on? What is the model that we could possibly base that on? And recognizing that land use systems, because of the huge demographic changes, have, have changed dramatically in recent <coughs> years, and also because of the commercialization. And also I think the point that's often missed when we talk about land utilization plans is the overlapping rights. Because of these seasonal movements, you find that multiple groups will share rights within a, same, within a small area. So that means there is a legal pluralism. There is a combination of customary law, federal law, Sharia law. It's all coexisting. But essentially, there are multiple overlapping rights that have to be upheld. So we're talking about quite a complex um, land use utilization plan and we need to just bear in mind what it's going to be based on and finally just to say that um, in taking forward those kinds of ideas and it also in relation to this issue of the north-south border and I would agree it's been given um, far too little attention too late is that we still have the opportunity to learn lessons from these local experiences and from the work in East Darfur you know, many of our herders that we're monitoring were able to go down into South Sudan last year for very specific reasons. And I think that's the experience we need to look at and learn from. Thank you, Helen. We're just about out of time, but if anyone has a burning question, a brief, very brief burning question that they'd like to raise, we're happy to, to take that on. Are there any further, any further questions? Very brief? Yes, very brief. Um, um, could you just wait for the microphone? Thank you. We don't seem to have any questions from our online audience, so everything must have been absolutely crystal clear. Yes, my name is Kamal Ibrahim. I'm a visitor. I just uh, happen to be here in London and attend this very valuable workshop. Um, my question is that uh, it has been uh, still uh, the local, local demand and local uh, markets for, for meat is uh, compared to the uh, production of cattle and sheep in Sudan is very minimal. So the concentration on, on Saudi Arabia and Egypt right, as, as prime markets for our outlet for the cattle is still the commanding and what we have to look for, how to develop the markets in Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Both markets um, need some sort of, uh, of uh, we have to solve the problem of the local taxation, the uh, road uh, transportation and right and uh, uh, minimal uh, transportation costs because the herders have to go on right um, on the pastoral uh, lives up to now to cut down the feed feed uh, expenses on that sort of things to reach 
the uh, market at Omdurman for sales or market at Port Sudan for uh, the Saudi Arabia. It is true that uh, also there are problems with Saudi Arabia, sometimes political, sometimes it's because of the um, vet, uh, uh, let us say, quarantines and so on, and also with Egypt. But also this has to be uh, uh, addressed. The third thing is that, is that we have to see that in Sudan there is a desertification. Every year, desertification is going 15 kilometers southwards. So this means that at one time, we will have all our cattle, our soil, not sheep, but at least cattle, and so on, going southwards. And when we saw southward, the southward to Bahr al Ghazal is not even Bahr al Arab, because all this is being there. Can so you can you wind up, please? Yes, yeah. Bahr al Ghazal, and this is also right the uh, relation between Sudan and South regarding this future of that have to be addressed. Fourth is that any any uh, therefore peace agreement have to indulge in the wealth of the Darfurians, which is cattle at, and sheep and and animal resources in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think we're going to have to wind up, unfortunately, so I'm just going to give the floor back to our panel. Okay, but I have about this plan. But I, sorry, no. I, th I think we're going to have to wind up, but afterwards there will be time f for you to engage with the panelists after the, the event is over. Thanks. I'm sorry to have to cut people off, but we just have a limited amount of time. Does anybody on the panel want to have any further comments to make? I mean, that was more of a, of a comment than uh, a question. I mean, I think the only thing I would say very briefly is, uh, picking up on that, is um, um, when we were doing the On the Hoof study, in a sense, we started with a more micro focus, looking at, so what has been the impact of the conflict on the livestock trade? And we very quickly realized we had to step back and look at the bigger picture and really pay attention to federal policy um, and and strategies around export. So, I think it just pr it, you know one can't just look at us at a part of Sudan. Whatever you look at, you have to look at it in the bigger picture. But I won't say any more than that. Mm. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Severia? Um, well, on, on the desertification side, the good news is that apparently it's not quite like that. Uh, so hopefully. <laughs> 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 Spe especially 15 kilometers south is really uh, um, not, not very much like that. Um, and uh, um, on the on the export, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I have understood you correctly. Uh, are you saying that most of the market is commanded by the demand for meat from outside, so is is export? Yes. Right. Well, we found we found that that's very much not true. Uh, that might be the bit of the market that is more visible or more important for because of currency, you know, foreign currency. But is is very much not true. It's very much the other way around. Is is a huge domestic market compared to a very very small, important of course, but very very small uh, export market in proportion, eh? uh, um, and which which means that yes, the export market is is a is a, is a very good news because it brings foreign currency into the country, but the, the domestic market is even better news because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, force the country to import uh, uh, and therefore to spend foreign money. So what you can save is also important, not just what you can gain. Uh, uh, and if you save 98% and you gain 2%, then you really have to keep an eye on what you save. Thank you very much, Severia. Helen, you a very quick comment? Yes. Um, just uh, in response to the comment about the desertification, I just wanted to, to make the observation that um, Sudan, with its new border, is essentially now defining itself as a, it's a dry lands country and characterized by extreme climate variability. And in other words, there are deca dry decades, there are wet decades. And this is something that pastoralists really appreciate. So when the Jizu blooms and they're able to go to the north, their camels are going to thrive. But I also want to make the point in closing that in, unlike many countries, in Sudan, pastoralism is not something practiced on the periphery by a minority. 
It is the system of production that, that contributes to the vast majority of the national herd. And recognizing that and understanding that and how it plays out in a drylands country is really what I think is important to understand as Sudan goes forward. And I think that's, uh, we'll end on that very clear and concise point. But thank you very much to our panelists today, Margie, Severio, and Helen, to our online audience. <laughs> and to our online audience for joining us, and especially to those of you in the room. So please do join us um, outside the room, where you have a chance to talk to the panelists in more detail because I can still hear people speaking, so I know you have lots to talk about. Thank you very much.